Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash this weekend for a free $200 credit. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, the host of This Week in Startups. And today on the program, our startup of the week is Obvious Engineering, and they are in augmented reality, AR. What does that mean? It means taking virtual reality, taking the internet, the interwebs, if you will, and then combining them and mixing them in real time with the real world. It's crazy, Japanese, futuristic, Blade Runner stuff. And we've got one of the companies that's actually trying to make it into a real business on the program today. Stick with us. We're going to blow your mind. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. I am Jason Calcanis, the host of This Week in Startups. And if it's your first time viewing, where the hell have you been? We've been doing this for about three or four years. We have 300 episodes in. What do we do on This Week in Startups? We talk about entrepreneurship. We talk about founding companies. We talk about making a dent in the universe, trying to make something from nothing, the creative process, the thing that separates the creators and the samurais from the rice pickers and the consumers. We need those consumers. We need those rice picking, just drones who just buy product after product and service after service. But we also need those samurai, those brave warriors who try to create stuff in the universe and who wind up getting their ass kicked and arms chopped off in the process half the time. But that being said, it is the life we have chosen. And today we'll have one of those great entrepreneurs on the program. And boy, this is one of those samurai who is going into the den of danger by trying to build something in the augmented reality space, which is incredibly new, incredibly innovative, and the prospects of this ever becoming a business, most people would say it's going to fail. And that's why I love this startup. I love the startups when people say, that's too crazy. That'll never work. To me, that's an indication that you want to lean in and get to know that guy. So when somebody sent me an email and said, look at this augmented reality, look at these games, look at these uh, marketers participating in augmented reality, I got it immediately. And I said, hey, book them. Book them for the show. And this show is brought to you by our friends at SendGrid. SendGrid is the industry leader in sending transactional emails. If you're in the startup world or if you've ever used a service like Pandora or StumbleUpon or Pinterest or Foursquare, you know what a transactional email is because you get them all day long. Those are those emails that say, hey, you've just been registered. Click here to confirm. Hey, your friend just pinned something to your board or they're following your board. Or uh, da, 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 da. You've got some friendship reminders. You've got a password reset. That, that's transactional email. If you try to build that stuff yourself, you're going to waste months and months of time doing a bad job at it. And you're going to lose customers in the process. Or you can use SendGrid and just use their custom... API and make your integration really easy. Get analytics on a dashboard. All that stuff that you'll never get a chance to build when you build your crummy version of SendGrid and you waste all your time instead of building the actual product that your customers want. And by the way, it's free for up to 200 emails a day. So you can get started using it with no risk. No risk. Start using it and it just works like I said, Foursquare uses it, Pinterest uses it, StumbleUpon uses it, Pandora uses it. Amongst a long list of amazing companies using SendGrid, what a great company. 200 emails a day for free. Go ahead and sign up for SendGrid and tweet thank you at SendGrid for sponsoring this week in startups. So Andrew McPhee is on the program. He is the founder, uh, I'm sorry, co-founder and CEO of Obvious Engineering. He's actually at Rocket Space, our friends in Rocket Space in San Francisco. Andrew, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, and so uh, you're there at Rocket Space, I see, and I can see behind you uh, out the window is the high-speed rail, the California high-speed rail. How's it going there, building the high-speed rail? It's, it's growing at high speed. I thought I'd try and give you like a little bit of office vibe and a little bit of uh, skyline. There you go. I see that. Um, so you're over there in Rocket Space, the great co-working space where we've taped some episodes of This Week in Startups, working on Obvious Engine. What is Obvious Engine? Um, well, we're, we're a computer vision company, and our goal is to link the digital world and the physical world. Um, and we are doing that using computer vision. Uh, I think, you know, we've, we've, we talk about augmented reality, uh, but it is a bit of a poison term, I think. The, I think the experience of so far haven't really lived up to the potential, and so we're, we're here to change that. Great. And so here's a video of um, the obvious engine. Uh, now, is it obvious engineering or obvious engine? 
We are Obvious Engineering, and the first product we've made is called the Obvious Engine. Got it. Okay. And so here's a video of uh, a Dr. Pepper can um, wobbling back and forth. You're looking at it through your uh, iPhone, obviously, and I see uh, that it's making the can do all kinds of weird things. What is the point of that, and why is it important? Right. So... Um First of all, uh, something you mentioned in the intro is, you know, like it, it's tough to grow a business. We've actually been quite fortunate. We are, we are already a business. So we've already done six figures in revenue. Um, we haven't had to raise an angel round. So that, that video is really us showing some of our experiments. Um, and by posting it online, I think we had about 100,000 views in the first week or so. And we had a lot of inbound interest, like hundreds of companies. And I've, I've been, you know, I think I had my first company at 20 and I've never seen anything like this in terms of response. And we've had companies coming to us telling us the problems they're trying to solve. And, and no matter what industry you're in, if you're a car maker, uh, a gene therapy company, a, a shoe company, or you make some kind of toy, you're trying to find how... How do, you, how do you get attention? How are you relevant? And how do you make revenue in this world where we're suddenly seeing a convergence of uh, digital and physical, you know, online and offline? And so we are the, we're that kind of meeting point. We're facilitating that. So when, when you see Dr. Pepper, and you didn't do that for Dr. Pepper, you just put that out as a test case? Or did you, do in fact, do that for Dr. Pepper? Object. Um, but we weren't doing that for Dr. Pepper. Okay, so you weren't doing it. I lost you for a second there. You weren't doing that for Dr. Pepper. You just did it to show how powerful the engine was, correct? Yeah, yeah. And so what we're seeing there is um, you load some kind of an app, I'm assuming, on your iPhone. And if it recognizes that that's a Dr. Pepper can, certain virtual assets will start dancing around or certain effects will happen. But if I were to do that with a can of Pepsi or something else, uh, club soda, salsa water, if you will, uh, nothing happens, correct? Well, <laughs> funnily enough, Pepsi, Pepsi have recently licensed it, licensed it, so, you know, in some, some territories, something will happen. Um, but, yeah, the idea at the moment is that um, you, you are, you, we're, we're connecting or, you know, people are connecting these experiences to objects. Right. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of where we sit at this point in time. Obviously, you know, as we go forward, it's really just... Uh, Content that's responsive to space. You know, mm -hmm. that's our goal as a company is being able to facilitate content that's responsive to digital, digital content, physical space. Hmm. And so here's another one. This is an AR beach volleyball game. And uh, I'll pull that one up. Um, and this is now you've gotten to not just fooling around with, I'll, I'll preface it a little bit, but we're not just fooling around with a can, we're actually playing a game. Now, was this made... Um, for a specific company, or was this made again on spec? Was this one of the six-figure no, deals? Was, this was uh, this was Corona coming coming to us, um, and I guess you know there's there's different ways you can look at this. So um, as a as a company, we are we are solving this problem of you know digital relevance or relevance of physical objects in a digital world. So with brands and you know people kind of making FMCG products. We are, we're adding, we're connecting their story or um, entertainment or information to their objects. Um, and, and, but that's only one side of it. So that's the side we're building out now. Hmm. Um, but the, the Corona game, it's like a multi-device, multi-level, multiplayer game, hmm. is made for Corona. And the idea is that you, when you look at the bottle, you unlock that experience. It's a game that you can suddenly play and you can play with friends. Got it. So here's how the game works. I see somebody holding a, um, an iPad. You put the Corona there, and because the Corona's on the table, um, you can unlock all these different skill levels, and you can play on Corona Island or something this AR volleyball game, correct? Correct. Yeah. But that could, um, you know, that could equally be a toy where suddenly you're giving the toy an environment, um, the ability to connect with other toys or play with people who have toys but are in a different location. So it's really, this is one of the first things actually to come out using our technology, but it's kind of just the beginning of what we're working on. Um, and there was a Disney 
um, ha- has Disney experimented with this yet? I've, I've seen Disney do a, one where you put a car on your iPad and it interacts, but um, ha- has anybody... <laughs> What's that? You froze on me. Has Disney... Yeah, sorry about that. Um, so I'm just wondering about Disney or other major brands. Has anybody in the major, you know, licensed character space actually done an augmented reality product other than some of the French-made stuff we saw out of Japan a couple of years back? Um, I think, you know, really you're looking at companies like Sony or Nintendo have really been pushing it. So mm-hmm. um, one of our founders, is a he's a, a computer vision PhD, and he's actually, he came from Sony. So he worked on quite a lot of their different titles. Um, so you've kind of got some really big players who have been pushing out. Mm. Um, and then you've got, I think, a lot of brands that experimented really early on. But we're only just beginning to see the interesting stuff come online. Like now everybody has a device that can power it. Um, and we have product makers who are starting to experiment in what you can do. So, you know, it, within a very short amount of time, you know, I think we're going to start to see a lot more of the utility coming from this field. For example, when, when you shop online, it's okay to read a description, but you really want a photo and, you know, video is better than that. What we can do is actually you know, project a, uh, a virtual example of a product that you're about to buy within physical space. You know, like, so there is, there's many ways it can be um, deployed into market. And so we're really just starting to kick that off at the moment. So if I wanted to see what a certain vase would look like on my uh, desk, I could take out my iPhone, point it at the desk, select the vase from Amazon's extensive collection and see the vase in 360 degrees on my desk. Absolutely. You could then swap that vase and make it a coffee machine and then see how it pours coffee or sunglasses or jeans or shoes. I mean, actually, one, one company that's just come to us is, is working in gene therapy, and it's more for them, how, how do you visualize what happens inside of the body? And, you know, and how do you do that in a way that's shareable to, to, to everyone? So being able to deploy experiences on you know, um, iPhones and Android devices is actually you know, that's a real game changer. You don't need a webcam and you don't need high-powered software anymore. Now, is, as an entrepreneur, you're running this company. Um, is this one of these situations where you have a very promising technology, but you're too far ahead? Because we've been talking about virtual reality now for 20 years. Mm-hmm. Really, virtual reality didn't happen. There's no major example of virtual reality, except for maybe massively multiplayer games, I guess, I guess would fall into that category. So in gaming, it sort of worked, right? Nobody would deny that Star Wars or World of Warcraft as a virtual reality experience isn't legitimate, it is. Um, but it didn't really permeate beyond gaming. Why, explain to me why augmented reality will permeate beyond gaming. Because I think if, if you're experiencing the the world online, which you, you know, like you live in a physical world, but you spend so much time in a digital world, but the, you know, you're still, um, you're not breaking through the wall. And, and what we're doing is actually helping these two worlds start to merge. Hmm. So, you know, if you're watching a 49ers game, you're already seeing content interacting with the, the video feed, you know, hmm. like, so it's, it's actually, you've got heads up displays and cars. So we're, we're already starting to see this stuff come out. Right. It's more that the technology to power it has only just arrived in your pocket, you know, and it takes time to develop an experience. So I, I think, you know, the next 12 to 24 months is really stuff, stuff starts to come online. Like we've already, we've hit an inflection point, you know, like if you look, if, I don't know if you have children, but like if you look at a child today, they will play on your iPad and they will expect the physical world to also be responsive. Like they don't necessarily see this difference in digital content and physical content and and, right and so that that's a whole different mindset that's coming you know coming of age uh clearly uh yes children my daughter walked up to the tv and tried to swipe it the other day or my blackberry didn't quite work children trying to there's a famous video of children trying to pinch a magazine image to make it go bigger and smaller um and so how much of um working in this for you was inspired by say seeing minority report or the work of william gibson or or other science fiction are you a science fiction junkie is are you as an entrepreneur trying to make science fiction reality do you know i um i I come from a uh like a user interface design user interaction background but before that i actually worked in film doing special effects and 
you know, you would spend weeks working on something that would last a couple of seconds. And now we have these, you know, devices and the technology to make uh, these magical experiences happen straight away. And, you know, so it's, it's, it's really this, this interest of mer merging these two worlds is, I think that's what kind of drives everybody in the team, like, um, and, and, and creating that moment where suddenly it's seamless and you, you pause reality and you just start to engage with this, what's next. Um, and when, when we, put the, we put a video online, like I mentioned, and, we, and, and I think it was on Gizmodo in the comments, someone, someone just said, hey, this, this is just so obviously a fake, you know? And at first we're like, this is because we, we made yeah. this and it works. But then we're like, whoa, 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 we just did it. You know, like we, we've made someone um, just assume that it's not even possible. Right. And you know, like, so, and, and the form factor, you know, like we're really interested in like, like say Google Glass, right? Yep. So what we've seen is more GoPro vision, you know, as a, as a product that's come out, but you know, where, where can that take us? Suddenly, suddenly we know we're, we're freed from holding these objects um, and, and we can just be more interactive with the world, you know, and yes, I am a William Gibson fan. <laughs> and, and so, the hardware is a big piece of this. I mean, we would admit that without hardware, this has been sort of a DOA when, they, when it had to use a webcam. But now that we have uh, iPhones and Google Glasses, what impact would Google Glass have on your space? If people were wearing this all day long, would that really make what you're doing um, reality in your mind? I, I think, you know, iPads, iPhones, Android devices, they're already doing it, you know, it, it, it really, it, I think when you have a different form factor like eyewear, it becomes even more seamless, you know, like this notion that you would no longer buy a TV, you would just have a plane within space that you could look at. Um, so, you know, so we're really interested in, in linking this, these experiences and content to space. Like, imagine, imagine if you will, you've got a game and it changes the parameters based on how you move objects on the desk. Like it really starts to understand the world and the differences in it, you know? So the, our, our technology roadmap extends quite a long way. And so what we're trying to do is step back and say, what can we power today? So we're trying to make and, and, and um, productize the best experience for now, whilst we work on what's next and what's next. And um, what do you think the, I mean, I see you're doing stuff with marketing and gaming. Are there activities you think that a civilian wouldn't anticipate would be a killer app? Obviously, gaming seems to be the place that a lot of these new technologies get applied, and we're seeing it with, obviously, the Kinect from Microsoft and stuff like that. What, what is the application that people are not anticipating that augmented reality and your company might enable? Well, I mean... Obviously, a lot of this stuff is, I guess, for us, kind of under wraps. Ah. Um, but we, we very much, I think one way you can kind of segment the market is that um, the, consume, the consumer experience side is, mm. is quite open. Um, so, you know, we very much want to power what happens there. So, you know, the, the reason we're, we are doing a lot of work with FMCG is very much that we put a demo online with a, a product that you could buy in a supermarket, and, and you know, and that what that taught us is that we have to educate the market. So if we put out a demo, suddenly people in that space are like, "Oh, I, I suddenly understand how my my content can be there, or my story can be engaging and and, and linked to my object." You know, so you know, our, our role over over the next twenty four months, at least, is is really focused on education. So our R and D, we then turn into experiments which we post online. And suddenly people learn what they can do, you know, so if it's a better way of shopping, you can't really visualize that. You just kind of, you don't, because you don't know it exists. You just have to experience it. You know, right. like so a, maybe I go shopping, I take out my iPhone, I point at the turkey and it shows me a recipe or how it might look when it's finished. Well, you know, like uh, you, you buy some high tech running shoes and they, there's all this amazing technology in them, but you don't even know how it works. And the company can't even explain that to you. But now you could, you know, you could look at it through a device and suddenly, you know, you can see how everything flows. Ah. You know, and, 
So, you know, there's, there's many, many different examples, but... Um, so I get know, IKEA we, furniture, and I have this mess of IKEA furniture on the floor. I put my iPhone on it, and it tells me, like, hey, put A to B to C, and I can actually see in real time what I'm supposed to be doing. Exactly. Just, I, you know, it's whether you're buying products, you're learning about them, you're trying to get deeper value out of them, like, you know, the example where a toy can talk to a web service, and it can guide you in how you play with it. Like, all of this is becoming possible because we, we suddenly own, you know, these magical pieces of glass, the, mm. the iPhone, the iPad, the, the, the Android device. How come Apple's hasn't done anything with augmented reality themselves? It seems like, you know, if anybody was going to innovate, is that a sign that they're actually working on something or that it's just too far out because they have to wait for a couple more people to go up the hill. Apple typically waits to not be the first mover. I, I would say right now, uh, from our own experience, from people who have been contacting us, everybody is working on something. It's really just a case of uh, when are they deploying it to market? Yeah, so clearly Google has been very upfront with Glass. What do you think? Apple has a product in R&D right now. H how certain are you about that, would you say? That's not something I could totally intelligently comment on, but we know... Uh, well, have you heard from other people that Apple's working on it? Let's put it that way. We know they've been dabbling with computer vision, hmm. um, and we know that a lot of their competitors in different markets have been dabbling. So, you know, one thing that we've been... We've spent about nine months now um, validating the problems that we think we solve, hmm. and... A lot of it has been inbound interest. So we had about 400 companies contact us in the week that we put our first video online. And, you know, like we're going from e-tailers to shoe manufacturers and everybody has uh, this problem that they're trying to solve. And so we've been looking at commonalities and we've been trying to make product for it. Hmm. Um, so, you know, we, 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 we're not trying to be super focused on what everybody else is doing. We're trying yeah. to find our own path. Yeah. Um, and... Yeah, you know, th things for us, like I said, we, we didn't have to actually go and get funding, but now we've hit this point where we feel we're ready to grow what we're doing. You know, we validated yeah. a problem and we're ready to scale it. So how do um, you go to uh, how do you go to a venture capitalist and say, listen, there is no market here today that's coalesced yet, but we're so um, we're getting inundated with every time we put out a piece of delightfulness. Hundreds of people say, make us something delightful. How did they figure out what your business will be? Because it's not like you're saying, like, hey, we're Groupon. It's like coupons with a G, you know, or, hey, we're Facebook. It's like MySpace, but it's faster and cleaner. You know, there's really no analogy to what you're doing, is there? No, it, it, correct. Like, we, it's not easy to say we are social. Hmm. Yeah. We're on the ground floor of a new medium, right? And and so it's really like tack, tackling what you think is a problem, which is what we've done, and then growing from there. So, you know, our, our vision extends so far beyond what we're doing now, but, you know, we've really focused in on making money and then looking at how that extends into different markets and then mm -hmm. having it like a, a proper conversation, like the... Someone has to have it, be able to think on like a slightly bigger scale to be able to kind of grok what we're doing. Like you, you saw it and you, you had a feeling for it, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like it's just this this window of opportunity is open. As much as we're solving a problem, we're we're enabling a new opportunity. So it's and, sort of like going to America. It's like you're asking the Queen, like, hey, give us some. You got the Nina, of this Pinta, the Santa Maria. We know there's something over there. Could be spice. It could be gold. Who knows? But we know it's a new world, and we know it's worth going to. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is, that's venture capital to a T, right? Like, you, you're either funding something that's already successful, or you're, you're, you're placing educated bets on what yeah. you think the future will hold. So, you know, we've already, we're, we're already making money, and I think that's, that's quite a critical point. Like, so we're... We, you know, we have a base in London, and we are now coming over to the to San Francisco. Um, and part of that is to have more investor conversations. But the other side is, you know, we're spending actually most of our time talking to existing clients or new clients. So, 
it's like we, we were, I guess we validated the opportunity for ourselves. It's really just who wants to come along for the ride. Yeah, and who's you have the, who's I mean, the right fit. Also, the customers are in a way are paying for your R and D, are they not? Absolutely. You know, like it's it's been really amazing to be doing something that people want. You know, like I, yeah. I hate I hate it when you see an interview with a startup and they say something like, "Ah, uh, you know, we're in no hurry to make money." It's like, you know, yeah. we. we we want. We made a product really, really quickly, um, based on our experiments, and we've been refining that, and we've been matching how it grows based on what actual clients and customers want. Well, how and do you balance that with the need to build something truly innovative? Because your clients are not going to know something truly innovative in all likelihood. So, how do you balance? building something that you could own 100% of the intellectual property on, owning your own Facebook, owning your own iPhone, owning your own Microsoft Office, Xbox, whatever it is, versus doing service business, which, let's face it, it's great because it's paying for your R&D, but there's no upside in service-based businesses or very little. Absolutely. So we actually have other companies develop on, on our platform, on our product. So, you know, we're, we've only been doing stuff as so far as it, we want to prove out something new with our technology. Hmm. So, you know, having tens and then hundreds and then thousands of companies developing using your product is, and, and like, you know, being the intel inside yeah. of, of, of this medium, you know, that's a really exciting position to be in. Um, we're not interested in the service side, but doing a response bespoke you know deals and make, and working on totally new products with people we are interested in so what about making the glasses i mean at some point somebody's got to make the hardware and you probably could write the spec on what this hardware should be since you've got the clients better than anybody are you as a founder just uh, is it just too much to ask of a founder and a startup to take on hardware and software at the same time and platform client business and hardware or do you have to just raise a ton of money and go for it on all three levels all pieces of the stack if you will i think it's a very good question because finding what to focus on is obviously a very tough thing for a new company um we our interest does extend in to hardware but more how it's it's using our software and you know it's, it, that's kind of a, 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 a longer term interest of ours like right now there's amazing companies that make amazing hardware and it runs our software perfectly and so we're really pushing the experiences yeah. you know like we, we see ourselves as powering and also pioneering a lot of stuff what does google think of what you're doing obviously sergey's very into the glasses you've obviously played with the glasses what do you think how far along is their project? When would we see somebody, a civilian, let's say, walking down the street with Google Glass? I, I would like to say, like, that things would be, you know, t 10 years, it, it, it won't be uncommon. So in and 10 then, years, it won't be uncommon. Yeah, but, you know, it's, it's, it's like you have to have, like, from talking to chip manufacturers, it'll be, you know, couple of years until the next generation of stuff comes out and then suddenly things get more powerful and, and use less battery and you know the form factor can change and so you have more entrance into a market um, I would say within 10 years that kind of stuff you know on the, that kind of hardware it'll be pretty normal I think in five years um, these kind of digital ex physical ex experiences will be standard in terms of how you how you buy something or how you experience something before you buy it or mm. or how you extend the longevity or the engagement of a product you already have, like giving a toy a social dimension. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I guess for us, it's really, you know, talking to investors, it's really explaining the, yes, we, we see some really killer B2C opportunities, but right now it's like the building blocks, like we're selling stuff, we're building that out and scaling it and, and you know, like the... You know, just, just selling them on the bigger vision and that we're, we're the right folks to kind of go to the next step and go to the next step. Like, I read a post of yours the other day where you're talking about going from, from great to excellent. You know, and that's, that is really, really interesting. So I think we're, we're, we're going from good to great. And 
you know, how we go to the next step and which market we go in is still TBC. How do you stay motivated as an entrepreneur when you're in such a nascent market? It's got to be incredibly frustrating because you know that if you just did, you know, a YouTube competitor or a Facebook competitor or yet another crowdfunding site, you know, a Kickstarter competitor, you would actually get more, you know, positive response quicker than trying to solve a hard problem. How do you keep your motivation up when... Let's face it, you're going to be banging your head against the wall to get from okay to good to good to great for a couple of years. And excellence, to your own admission, is a five- or ten-year journey. Yeah, I think, like, the there's a couple of different sides, you know. Like, we're, we're in this we, – we live on this lab-to-living room spectrum, you know. So, like, we're, we're constantly doing things in the lab, and then we're productizing, you know, what we've got now that's stable and putting it into the living room. And I think like, actually I've totally lost my train of thought. It's okay. <laughs> You're thinking about exactly how hard it's going to be to get from uh, the okay, lab okay, gotcha. to the living room. How do you keep yourself motivated? How do you keep yourself motivated. from giving up? I mean, it's like going across the Atlantic for the first time. You know, okay. a lot of people I, said I mutiny. Ask, yeah. <laughs> when you, when you, when you believe in something, when you have a passion for something, when you're not just trying to do a Me Too clone, when a business is more than just an amount of money you can make, that, that's what drives you. You know, like the, when you believe you're on the cusp of something really, really big, that, that's what drives you. You know, and uh, when, you meet, when you meet people who believe in that as well, that's what drives you. You know, like the, the venture industry is a very interesting one. You know, it's like, there are a lot of people in it, but just like startups, some people are totally clueless, whereas others are taking very educated risks on what's next. We don't think we're going into oblivion, you know, like we're looking at how you use mobile, how you use web, you know, how you use 3D, the convergence of digital and physical, and we feel like actually we're, we're, not, we're not so far ahead of the curve, you know, like in, in terms of adoption. Yeah. We're, we're already there. It's just a case of... Um, growing the number of people who get to experience you know, on a daily basis. Well, I mean, if you look at the uh, Microsoft Connect, I mean, that seemed like far-fetched stuff until it wasn't, right? Until they got to an excellent, great to excellent product, it, it just took off from there. So, I mean, it's really that, that easy, right? Yeah, I mean, th those guys are scratching the surface and they're doing it in such an amazing way. Like, you know, they're starting to understand you, but when, when content is responsive to the whole world, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible, it's a step change, hmm. you know, and I, if, you know, in terms of building a company, like I believe in the people I'm working with and I believe that's what we're working on. And, you know, we, we've already seen from revenue that it's, it's not like a, a dream. It's, you know, people actually want it. Like it's an amazing feeling to be actually selling products based on what you do. Um, and so, to be, I guess getting to there where it's, you've got this great moment where, the dream is becoming a reality. You're starting to see this thing that people said could not be done and would not have any legitimate purpose actually start to have purpose. Well, look, you know, it's like we, we came over to San Francisco, you know, this, on this trip, we've been here, you know, for a little while and someone sent you a link and it was worth you talking to us. Yeah. You know, so like that's the effect that we have, we're having on everyone we're talking to. Um, and so it's really just, Getting, getting the momentum going. You know, like right now, the stuff we're working on, you know, you're only just starting to see the light of day, you know, the, the, the stuff that we've been developing. So, yeah, it's early, it's early days for us, but we're pretty well, excited about it. Momentum is critical for entrepreneurs, and it seems like you guys are, uh, are building that momentum and um, really do appreciate you guys uh, coming on the program and sharing it with us today. Everybody uh, check out Obvious Engineering. Uh, obviousengine.com or at Culture Engine uh, to follow Andrew and great success and um, thanks to Rocket Space for hosting you guys. How's it over there? You enjoy being at Rocket Space? You're meeting new people all the time? I, I've got to say, like, you know, I happily plug Rocket Space. It's, it's allowed someone who's um, started off in Europe to come yeah. to, to San Francisco and actually plug into a network and that is quite, a, that's a priceless thing. Um, and I'd just like to say to, to your audience, um, they probably don't know this, but 
before before we went live, like you you've got quite a good singing voice. Yeah, I do have a pretty good singing voice. That's true. Uh, and uh, hey, um, how different is it being in America versus being in London as an entrepreneur and how you receive? Because it seems like in London town, you get a people are pretty damn pessimistic and, and sometimes pretty critical of the entrepreneurs. And I know in San Francisco, it's absolutely delusional. And if you tell people you're, you know, doing augmented reality, they know actually what you're talking about. How is that? Well, I think it's, it's funny you say that a lot of the most interesting companies in the space are actually, I think, based in Europe. Um, mm. The big thing I've noticed is more people here know someone who've had, who's had a billion dollar company. Mm. So, Whereas in Europe, someone's like, oh, if I try really hard, we might make a million dollars. Yeah. Over here, you know, it's like it's a whole magnitude out and um, or several magnitudes out. And I, I, so I, I think people think bigger here. And I think in terms of growing a business, that's definitely a better attitude. And I think the time frame, like, you know, so a real eye opener for us is that a conversation with a company um, can take months to generate in Europe, you know, like three months, six months. Here, you can meet someone and three days later, they've introduced you to the next person. And, um, you know, that, 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 that's a game changer. That's why we're really interested in, um, you know, spending a lot more time over here. Awesome. Well, continued success. And if anybody wants to get in touch with Andrew, he's Andrew at ObviousEngine.com. Andrew at ObviousEngine.com, at Culture Engine on his Twitter account. And hopefully I'll get to see you up there on my next trip. Thank you to SendGrid. And thanks to Andrew for being on the program. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.